come up with a little quick test that might be useful if, for me, I, when someone says, oh, I'm using Net Promoter, I have these three things that you have to be doing or you shouldn't call it Net Promoter. Number one is you have to be getting the score, uh, uh, categorizing. I don't care about the score. Are you categorizing customers into promoters, passives, and detractors in a systematic, transparent way that, that's, that's accurate, reliable? That's number one. Very few companies do even that. But number two, do you have a closed loop process where the right person in the organization gets in touch with the customer every time there's a failure, a zero through six? That's a disaster. Some, that cannot happen again. So someone obviously needs to call them, apologize, probe for the root cause, fix it, and get the solution back into the organization so they organize, you, know, you learn as a company, not just for that individual customer. And of course, if you have promoters generated, you have to have a similar closed loop of what was it we, did we do that wowed that customer? Is it economic? Are we wowing them in a way that's bankrupting us? Or is this a good kind of wow? And so closed loop would be the second. And then finally, this is a big deal. This is as much about a moral ethical code, the legacy that the leaders want for themselves as it is about economics. So do, do this, the, the senior executive team, especially the CEO, do they feel like creating more promoters and fewer detractors is mission critical for their company and for their own personal lives? And if those three things aren't going on, then it's, it's probably a superficial game that's being played, not, not someone who's really serious about taking this system and, uh, and, and getting results with it. When I, I mean, this, what, what you've just said sort of links to sort of a question I had, a general question I had about the book. I mean, it's interesting the way you described it before. The first book was, a, was more theoretical because you hadn't yeah. been doing it yet, and now this is it hadn't, practice. It hadn't been invented. <laughs> That's right. Carefully written to not make that obvious to the general reader. <laughs> yeah, so that is the trick, right? No, uh, um, uh, but then you say you, uh, the second book is chock a, chock a block full of, uh, full of examples because you've, you've got, got so, so much. So in one, in one sense, you know, the, 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 the first one was more theoretical and this was, was kind of less so and practical with examples. But it is also at the same time, it feels to me, although you can, you can tell me, it feels also more philosophical. It, it, as well, like as well as practical, you know, there's this sort of overlay as though, as though um, there's sort of the, a, a deep, almost a deeper message that you would like to communicate in 2.0 as compared to 1.0. Was it, one, am I reading it at all correctly, and uh, and was that was that your intent? Well, you're you're younger than I am, right? But you're close, and we're yeah. getting older together. So yeah. don't, don't you see the older you get, the the more confidence you have to say what you're really think and what you really care about. And it is true. Every, from the beginning, this was a, a philosophy of life. And, and I, I thought at a young age I had to be very practical in economics and rigor. And I think that is the correct platform. But, but really, really, if you want to give a gift to somebody, it, it's, it's how they can live a life they're proud of and point out, by the way, that happens to be in the best interest of your investors and, and your customers. So yeah, it probably is more philosophical. Um, but I've also seen the companies who succeed. I just haven't seen one company do great things with just the left side of the brain, pure, rational, manipulative, let, let's do this because it's going to make more money for us. It, it almost always comes from the, uh, the spirit of leadership. In fact, the guys in this NPS loyalty forum, it went NPS was the NPS score, and then it was NPS, NPS system. They, when, when I'm there, they say NPS is NPS spirit. There, I think that's probably the more powerful motivator. And yeah, I do try to signal that in the book without overdoing it, because I do still work with Bain, you know. And Got to crunch the numbers, yes. That's right. No, it, 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 is, it is interesting. I mean, for, uh, for me, I think there's this very kind of modern challenge, which is, which is if, you, if you look at most modern education, it is about um, helping uh, the students in question get better at manipulating quantities, yeah. right? Manipulate them in all sorts of interesting uh, ways. Like when you're a little, one, little, little person, it's manipulating by adding numbers together or maybe multiplying them or dividing them. And then it gets more, more complicated. It's doing regressions and the like. But it's all about taking quantities and doing something uh, useful uh, with them. And, and it strikes me that there's so little in our education system left that's about appreciating qualities, right? The subtle differences between things and being able to appreciate that. So, 
So, you know, you could go into an art museum and measure the paintings and say, well, that's a one, and that's a, that's a little one, that, that's a, like a four square, square, uh, square foot painting and whatever. That's a heck of a lot different than saying, I can appreciate the difference between that and that, and I can appreciate how that one, that one uh, was expressing this versus that. And, and, I, and I sometimes think that we get that sort of bias towards, towards the numbers and crunching them and everything being objective and rational because that's what we're teaching. I have, uh, uh, one of the companies I've worked with for a number of years actually joined the board of directors, which is something I thought I'd never do, join the a public board. It just seemed like a form over substance exercise so often. But this group said, Fred, we completely believe in that philosophy of management. We want to have a, the largest army of promoters in our business. It was a business I knew nothing about. It's uh, IT services and cloud computing. It's a company called Rackspace and, and is a leader in their area. When I joined the board three years ago, I think they'd just gone public. Their market value was less than a billion dollars. Today, their market value is five or six billion dollars and they've never had to issue stock. So an explosive success story in technology where a lot of people, at, even at Bain, how does this fit in technology where it's all innovation? And Well, the, the CEO, Lanham Napier, and I were together and he says, Fred, I finally figured out how we talk about Net Promoter and he, he, they've built it into their boardroom process. So we hear from a customer and look at customer Net Promoter scores and employee Net Promoter scores before we get to financials in a typical process. He said, Fred, we have all these metrics, and as a CEO, I have all the metrics of bigness. How many employees I have, how, how many revenues I have, how, how many servers we have. Uh, Net Promoter is, is the only metric I have for greatness. And, and of all the lives we touch, how many are enriched? How are we really influencing the lives? And so greatness, I think, is the right thing to measure, but most of the metrics we have, and I think much of what I learned in business school, that was rigorous. Yeah, there's a lot of airy-fairy talk about values, but the rigorous stuff, which appeals to me, it was all about bigness. Not greatness. Yeah. Not greatness. And I think as you pursue bigness, you get further and further away from greatness. It's why when companies adopt Net Promoter, who are big companies, it's a big cultural shift. It takes a courageous management team to recognize how much change would be required. But I think it's not impractical at all because you keep going toward bigness and you will be mediocre and you will collapse. It, it's almost this life cycle. Companies who should be big and powerful and unassailable from classic strategy thinking, all deference to Mike Porter, mm -hmm. smart guy, but look at the life cycle. It's like a 30 years from birth to death. And why is that? Because once you get big and think big is what this is all about, you'll go down a path.